Piers Langala, Director of SUSE Comms and part of the Food Service Circle family. I'm delighted to be back uh, in the, well, for the latest in the series of interviews with uh, leaders from across the sector talking about the, the, uh, the key issues of the day. Um, I'm especially delighted today to be joined by Jason Atherton. Uh, Jason um, doesn't really need any introduction from me, um, a seasoned chef and restaurateur. Uh, Jason has long been a supporter of the contract catering industry um, and has worked with various organizations, including, including the Compass Group. Um, Jason's kind of given up his time um, to offer us his thoughts on what's happening in the catering sector and beyond, and um, also give us some advice for um, some of the, uh, the chefs who've been impacted by uh, the fallout of the, uh, of the pandemic. So, hi Jason, how are you? You well? I'm really well, thanks Piers. I, um, you know, I'm so happy to say I'm extremely busy um, reopening the restaurants, which uh, can't come soon enough. And, you know, the insatiable appetite for eating out, even when it's raining on the street, is uh, incredible. Uh, I mean, last Thursday, for instance, it was a 6% chance of rain, and it did rain. And I was incredibly guilty having guests sat outside um, drinking wine in the rain, but they were just loving it. So, you know, I was like, wow, you know. Absolutely. I think it's been, it's been a long long time coming, hasn't it? So, uh, come Absolutely. Everyone's um, uh, outside. How is, um, how are you getting on generally? How's, how's the reopening been so far? Um, how have you found good. it? You know, good. I mean, you know, it's great to see familiar faces of all the guys we've, you know, had, you know, uh, either on furlough or gone on holiday or whatever they've done during the pandemic. And it's just lovely to see them all back, you know, back um, at work. The camaraderie, the camaraderie in the kitchen, the front of the dining room and the connection and the banter and, you know, seeing all the regular guests turn up. I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. You know? It's just absolutely wonderful. Getting back into the swing of things must have been quite challenging. What's the, what's the most kind of challenging thing you've had to face so far? I think, you know, the, the negativity, what comes with something like this, even though it's the first time in my lifetime we've ever been closed down by anything like this. You know, it's the negativity what's come with it. So, you know, it's been very difficult to understand why it's okay for a hundred builders to be on a building site, but it's not okay for 50 diners to be in a socially spaced fine dining restaurant um, with sanitizer stations, well controlled measures in place, eating food uh, in a controlled environment, not just so I can make money, but because you know people can go out, it helps their mental health, um, helps them socialize, it keeps staff in work, helps them pay their rent. And I just, it, it, that's been the hardest thing for me to deal with, I mean, to really understand the logic behind why hospitality has been treated as a one-stop shop, and has not been separated out to what is actually safe and what's not safe. Um, I think the government got a lot to answer for, for that because I think they've ruined a lot of people's lives unnecessarily. Um, and I think it's been um, extremely, extremely difficult to accept that. It has been. I think particularly where there's no lack of, uh, well, there's a lack of evidence of any sort. You know, we know transmission rates, um, according to all the all the kind of studies, have been um, lowest in hospitality settings. So it just it's quite, I, you know, it's difficult to uh, to stomach, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, you know, I'm not here to be a. Uh, conspiracy theorist that's not me I'm not here to complain that's why I don't complain I'm not here to moan about it I, all, all I say is it's like I just think it's a shame that we that we didn't have someone in our corner who could have really you know pushed the government and made an answer for why they shut the whole industry down like you say with a lack of evidence when they've kept other industries open um, because deep down it really suited them right you know construction getting the roads fixed getting buildings built and listen i'm all for that great you know but i think a lot like i said before a lot of people's lives have been ruined unnecessarily you know and i'm a full support of lockdown you know if we if we have to go into lockdown then for me the whole country goes in lockdown everything lock stock and barrel you know the catering sector as you um know quite well has um suffered um more than most um with workplaces being closed and that sort of thing um, I mean, firstly, is it worth just let, perhaps letting us know what, you, what kind of work you've done with the uh, contract catering sector over the years? Because I know you've been involved in all sorts of uh, different projects. And um, Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, very early on when I launched uh, the restaurant company with my wife, um, we soon uh, realised the value in partnering with people like Compass and RA. 
um, not only not only um, to um, enhance what we do, but also to share our story and our journey with people who necessarily wouldn't have the ability to regularly dine with us. Uh, I'll do something quite basic, um, but I'll do 600 portions and I'll serve it myself, you know, and chat with the guests, bond with them, do pictures, sign cookbooks, and just sharing that story with those people is, is, is really genuine and really nice. And they really appreciate that. I take time out of my day to do that. And um, that goes a long way to having people come back to our restaurants in the West End when they're not in their work, workplace. So for me, working in that sector is extre extremely important, not just to be able to show the big bosses what we do, but also to show the new generation of diamonds. So the people who are starting out their careers in those uh, establishments so that, you know, when they eventually get their um, shiny uh, credit card to go out and spend in lovely restaurants, they, of course, choose me. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that the grand plan then? I've got it, I've got it. Um, the, um, obviously, having worked quite, quite closely with them, you're, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a tough time at the moment. How, what do you think their biggest challenges are? You know, what is the biggest challenge in workplace catering at the moment? In I, think, I think, you know, the tragic thing in all of this is like, you know, there's so many talented people working in those kitchens, front of house, you know, wine directors, baristas, amazing talented people in hospitality. <laughs> who've put a lot of effort into these buildings um, to create an F&B strategy to make these people's daily lives inside their um, uh, workplaces more enjoyable, right? Because food and beverage is very enjoyable. We all know that. We all get extremely excited when we get invited out for dinner or we go around a friend's house for dinner or to the, even to the pub, right? Who would have thought that going to the pub to watch the football would be as exciting as it is today? Um, I mean, you know, who puts that in their diary now? But we do, right? Because it's just, it's, it's the new norm. And the tragic thing in all of this, we've lost a lot of that talent. You know, a lot of it is, has gone back to Europe. A lot of it's not coming back. I think that's a little bit Brexit as well as the pandemic. And it's going to take us a long time to rebuild that. And I think that's probably the most regrettable and unfortunate thing about this whole situation over the last 12 months. But on a positive note, um, because it's really important that we stay positive for all of this, is that, it's also given us time to rethink our values and rethink about what the future holds. Because when you're, when you're running at a million miles an hour and the machine's turning, you get very limited time to be able to stand back and look at your business and say, okay, what do we really offer? You know, are we really hitting the mark? Are we really you know, one of the leaders in our, on, our, on our field? And if we are, how much more can we push? And how much more can we you know, not, not just help ourselves, but help the people who are less fortunate? And I think that's, that's one of the bonuses of the pandemic, I think. So the negative is the talent. And I think the bonus is it's given us more time to really assess the future. Right? I think you mentioned this whole idea of actually um, you know, using it as an opportunity to kind of reset, you know, to reset and look at um, all, the, you know, all the things that make up um, our, our um, businesses and our day jobs and that sort of stuff. Um, does, that, does that still ring true to you? Absolutely. You know what, Piers, I've got probably 50, I'm 50 this year. I've got 15 years left, 10 years cooking at a very high level, where I push myself to the limits I push myself to. And then five years, probably more as an owner before I pass the business on. Um, and, you know, you say to yourself, okay, well, yes, we've achieved a lot. Yes, we've achieved, you know, Michelin stars, restaurants all over the world. We've done all that. But it's actually quite surprising how the lack of fulfillment is still not there. And what I mean by that is the biggest joy I have is cooking, period. Right? We might have busy restaurants, seeing lovely bank balances at the end of the month, seeing staff happy, being able to reward staff with shares. All of that stuff is incredibly important. But ultimately, I am the most happiest when I'm cooking the food. You know, when I'm literally, I've got a pan in my hand, I'm creating a beautiful dish and you know i know i know the minute i start playing it's gonna you know without being big headed that it's gonna taste absolutely delicious and i'm excited to see what the guests think of that and you know when people leave Holland street or any of the restaurants for that matter and they say on the way out oh, that was just incredible i don't know it's weird there's just no feeling like it there's just no feeling like it yeah. i think i'm the luckiest person in the world to have a job where I can make people happy and I make money out of it.
and I get self-satisfaction. I think that's, for me, that's like winning the lottery, right? It is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible thing, isn't it? I think, I think um, you know, sadly, as you mentioned earlier as well, there's a lot of people who've lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic, you know, and this, this feeling that you're getting, they're not able to get at the moment because of all the, you know, the consequence of, um, you know, the economic um, uh, damage that's been done to our, to our sector. And um, what, well, it's, it's quite hard to remain motivated. What advice would you give somebody who's, you know, ha- you know, unfortunately being put out of work because of what's happened. What, what would you say to them right now? I think, you know what, Birge, you've always got to remember the feeling pre-pandemic because the pandemic was no one's fault. So you can't blame yourself. So it doesn't matter if you've lost your work, it doesn't matter. But, you know, if you've lost your business, if you've lost your job, whatever it is, that, you know, as unfortunate as it is, you, 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 you know, if bookings continue like they are, it's, you know, we know how many months it's going to take us to get back on track. And we've got to stay focused on that, you know, and, you know, it'd be very easy to sell it all up and go and open a fish and chip shop in Cornwall and just live a nice life, you know. But, you know, you've got to say to yourself, look, you know, it, it was nobody's fault. It just, it just, it's life, you know, what happened is what's happened. And we've now got to make sure we do a good job. We owe it to our regular guests. We owe it to our team to get, the business back on track and that's what you've got to be committed to do it's like having a football team that's not played football for 10 months getting the match fit again and all that's extremely stressful but the minute the guests start enjoying the food the minute you see people enjoying themselves and the laughter and, the, and i said to my my company general manager michael west i said i said just take a minute and listen i said the noise of the guests and that little sound of the knife and forks and the plates and the chink of glasses i said it's like listening to an opera it was just beautiful to hear. Yeah. And I said, that's why we do it. But- so, so, for the, so for those who, who aren't able to do this and enjoy this at the moment because of what's happened, um, you know, would, what would you say to them? Because you know, clearly it's, it's a tough time. They're having to kind of, you know, hopefully things are picking up again, in, in, in particularly in catering as well. The industry will start, um, you know, recovering as, as people, more people go back into the workplace. And we're seeing that already. Hopefully, it's just going to you know, going to kind of accelerate as well. So, um, what would yeah. you say in the meantime? How they, you know, what can they do in the meantime to stay to stay well? I think you know, try and do good stuff because I'm listen. I'm a huge karma person. You know, if I've done, you know, I've, I've done one or two bad things in my life, you know, and it's come back to bite me on the bottom. And I've done an incredible amount of good stuff. You know. I, um, and I don't do it because I want karma to come back and share on me. I do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, because we've been extremely lucky through the industry to have a, a charmed life. Uh, but, you know, take your time to give back a little bit. You know, it's pretty hard to give back when you've got nothing. But I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time. You know, don't just sit and watch Match the Day all day. You know, I've been cooking at homeless churches. I've been cooking at NHS stations. I've been doing boxes for charity. You know, and... You know, I could just sit back and don't do anything really because I'm already the director of a couple of big profile charities and I give a back, enough back through that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm also, my, one of my, my eldest daughters got type 1 diabetes. I do a lot for that charity. And, but but the, the enjoyment of, you know, going down to St. Cuthbert's and feeding 400 homeless people um, who, you know, they're, they're even worse victims than all of this, right? And... It's just a good feeling, you know, and that 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 in itself is a nice thing to do. So I, I say, keep yourself busy, you know, plan for the future, and keep you know just keep plugging away because eventually hard work always pays dividends. A hundred percent, it's always stood me in good stead. You know, there's been times when it's been really dark, and I felt like my hard work's come to nothing, and then all of a sudden the clouds open up, an opportunity arises. And that's because I work hard, you? and you know, you make your own look in this world. You know, no one's going to give you nothing. Right? There's too many young people today, and I don't want to be generalisation who, you know, want the world to give them opportunities. And I'm afraid in our industry, you only get out what you put in. I'm afraid, and that's just it. Just is what it is. It's not Bitcoin. You know, you're not going to get some magical number pop up on your phone one day because, you know, you've you've struck lucky as a waiter or a chef. It's hard work. Right, and if you do really well in our industry, you can go places really quickly. And uh, once you do, it's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, 
So how, when you've had those um, kind of tougher moments in your life, what, what have you done to look after your mental health? What's, you know, do you have like a, a, a kind of go-to activity or a go-to thing that you do to make you get through these moments? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, I would, I've always tried to have a secondary interest um, even on the limited time I do have. So, you know, when I was younger, I used to play a lot of football, um, you know, joined a five-a-side league, to, you know, because the thing is, it's very easy to fall into alcohol, partying, drugs, you know, going out, and all, that's, all that is a spiral to nowhere. And, you know, I've worked for some very high-profile chefs in my time, and I've watched some chefs who've had marvellous restaurant empires, and they've crumbled because they've taken their eye off the ball. And, 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 you know, I've always promised myself, no matter how successful we'll become, I'll never, ever stop working on the detail because that's what keeps the guests coming back. You know, it's not, you know, I don't have to worry about light bulbs and light switches anymore, but I do have to worry about detail. You know, are we offering our guests a superior service? Are we offering, you know, great food? Are we offering great service? Are we offering great wine list? Are we priced, are we priced correctly? All the details going around, making sure regular guests are well taken care of. We remember people's birthdays. Um, you know, I was singing happy birthday to someone who was on social, you know, and she couldn't believe I was still there singing happy birthday. You know, and she said, My God, I can't believe you're here. But it's like, where else would I be? Do you know what I mean? They just think you're at home counting all the money, right? <laughs> and so what I do is I completely absorb myself in the business. And then when I'm off, I'm off. You know, at the moment, because I've got a young family, I spend a lot of time with my family. That fulfills me. Um, you know, before I had kids, I played a lot of golf, um, which I do dearly miss. And, you know, um, at the moment, I'm, tr- I'm teaching. I'm not teaching myself. I'm, I've had a teacher teaching me uh, boxing. So I've got pretty obsessed. Chefs are obsessive people. So I've got pretty obsessed about boxing. So I've been doing that for about three years, and I, I really enjoy it. Um, and so I just try to do that, right? Because boxing, you need to be fit. So I, every day, every morning at 6 a.m., I run 5K without fail i normally do one body part i go to work i work all day uh, i do boxing three times a week um and then you know it just keeps my mind alive and occupied and you know, i've always tried to do something like that uh, i don't want to be a professional boxer i don't even want to have a fight it's not about that i like watching on tv and it's it's really active for your mind you've got to really have eye contact coordination um, you know, we've even gone as far as sparring now. So, you know, you know, blocking shots, all that type of stuff. And it's what I like about it is I'm learning something new. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the important thing for me. There'll so, be a char- charity boxing match with you and Fred Sirius or something at some point, I guess. No, it's <laughs> golf. <laughs> um, but the, I guess the point around um, exercise is a good one, isn't it? You need to kind of keep moving and keep kind of active um, for when things do return and you kind of do go back into work, you need to be match fit as well, right? So that's the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a good message in that, I think. Yeah. I think with, um, so obviously knowing the contract catering sector um, as you do, um, how do you think things are going to play out? Because it's obviously a very tough time now, but as I say, things are improving. How do you see this changing kind of? Listen, yes, I do not believe for a single second, like all the papers reported six months ago, that the city of London's finished, everyone's going to work from home. It's total crap, right? And I'll tell you why it is, because if you were at university and you were going to go and work in the city or this or the finance sector, and someone said, which the reason why I'm saying this is because contract catering has to coexist with this, right? Not per se, but in, in, in general. You know, the whole point of working in that band sort of environment is, you know, you get up, they go to their gym, which might be in Liverpool Street, they go to work. You know, they bump to their colleague at pret manger They go up in the lift together. They arrange to go for a beer after work. There's a local pub. You know, they go and have drinks at City Social. I don't know, whatever it is, right? And then the next tier up from that is taking their clients out, right? You know, they're, they're gossiping about their holidays or doing a deal over dinner. That's the exciting stuff, right? Not sat at home with four screens in front of you trading in your bedroom, knowing that, you're going to go down and have spaghetti bolognese with the family in two hours. No disrespect to your family, of course, but, you know, that's not life. We all know that's total garbage, right? And if that did happen, 
the infrastructure in London will collapse because no one will be using the tube, no one will be using the trains, no one will be using the buses, no one will be using the pubs. And, you know, TF, we all know that TFL for London is already in massive trouble. And they'd have to start a be doing bedroom tax where people, if you work from home, you'd have to have your home tax because how else are the government going to make the money, right? Mm. It's the biggest it's the biggest taxpayer in this country, the finance sector. Mm. And contract catering goes hand in hand with it because, you know, every contract catering in the country has seven or eight of these massive buildings in the city of London, what they cater for because I've gone and cooked, cooked in them, right? And they put massive investment into that. So I think, yes, working from home will exist. I think it will be limited to one, two days a week maximum. And I think it will free, it will be three days in. And already all my regular guests are back in the restaurants going, we cannot wait. We couldn't wait rather to get back into town mm -hmm. because it was a bit of a thing, right? So I believe there's a massive future. And if anything, I think there's more opportunity than ever before. How do you mean? In what, in what respect? Where's your In the fact that, perfect example, we've launched a new product, the, the boxes, right? So we're doing culinary boxes um, where we're cooking for 500 people. Um, some are cooking in Hong Kong, some in London. Um, and I'm doing it live from a studio. And, you know, we're reaching customers we probably wouldn't normally reach. Um, so there's opportunities like that. I think there's opportunities in how, you know, if... What I think's gone is somebody coming from Japan for 24 hours for a meeting in London. I think that's done, right? I think someone, which we're exploring at the moment, is having a business meeting in New York and a business meeting in London, whereas we have a restaurant in both cities and one of my chefs going to their office and recreating that menu while my guys recreate the menu here in London in their offices and they're both doing this meeting over Zoom or Teams or whatever, while they're both having the same menu, is something really cool and unique. So that's something we've been working on. And I think these times make you think outside the box. To whereas before you said, well, why would you do that? Right? It's pointless, right? Just get somewhere over there to do it. But having that real life connection of them having the same menu at the same time on two time zones, but cooked by the same team is really cool. So I just think it creates new opportunities for them. Yeah. So if I mean, based on that as well, I think there's, there is, there are lots of reasons to be optimistic. There are, like in all of these things, there are opportunities um, created out of this kind of adversity that we're in at the moment. Um, if there's one message you want to send chefs in the contract catering sector um, right now, what would that be? I would say, look, you've got you to put, put, put your best foot forward, right? You've got to put your chin up. You've got to take control of your own destiny. You've got to go out there, demand quality. Don't do things half-heartedly. And you've got to show people that in our country, we've spent the last 20 years digging our cuisine out the doldrums. And now we're known as one of the best countries in the world for food. And we need to maintain that. That's my message. It, it is, you know, you're equally as important as Michelin star restaurants. You're equally as important as hotel restaurants. Contract catering gets a bit of a kick in the in the in the bum because it's always deemed the lower end of the market. But trust me, I've been working this 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 part of the market for ten years, and, and we've got some of the most talented chefs working working uh, in that sector. And we need to showcase that, you know, and, and and actually, you know, it's always been a bit of a thing because oh, you only work Monday to Friday, nine to five. Right, and it doesn't. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant if you work one hour a week or a thousand hours a week. Right, you're still showcasing the best of British. Right, and I, and my message to those guys is is do yourself proud. Right, you know, and it is what it is, and just be optimistic. And for the, and those people who are out of work, what's your message to them? There's loads of them. Trust me, I'm looking for like you have no idea how many staff I'm looking for at the moment because our reservations just gone boom. So for me, I think you've got to. You know, just get out there and just, just you know, I've, I've always, always found work. I've never not been out of work. You know, I, I've worked for free. I've done, you know, I've done everything. You know, I went to Spain. I worked for free. I worked for free in France. I, I even on my days off, I will go work in the kitchen for free to gain experience. And all of that enthusiasm seems to have gone a little bit in our industry. I'd like to see that back a little bit because every time I interview people, Nowadays, it's always how much and how many hours. 
Whereas that was always the, my last question. I wanted to know what I was going to learn, what section I could do, and how fast I could grow, right? And when they said, oh, yeah, do you want to know about the money? It's sort of like, well, as long as I can pay my rent, I'm training, right? Who cares, do you mean? And, and I'd just like to see a little bit of that enthusiasm back for our industry. And, and rather than treating it as a job, treat it more as a passion, you know, because the money will come. If, once you get good at this job, the money comes. End the story. Anybody in my, in my establishment who are good get paid really, really well. Do you mean? And, and that's because they're just bloody good at their job, right? And I can't afford to lose them. Do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. With those words, I'm sure you'll um, ignite the passion in lots of chefs uh, at the moment, and hopefully, they'll, um, you know, things will pick up for the uh, for the catering sector um, in the future. Um, it will. Yeah, sure. yeah. Finally, I just want to say thank you, especially for colour coordinating with me as well. I think we've done very well in this. Yeah, case. absolutely. Yeah. Come back green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but thanks again. Thanks so much. Cheers, for that. Good luck with all the, all the reopenings as well. Um, wish you well. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Thank Bye. You.